I also sing in church. That's one of my favorite songs. Amen. It's great to be before you this afternoon. Um, a little correction, the leaders meeting will actually be at 2.30 p.m. So leaders meeting at 2.30 p.m. You know, there was a common phrase that was used as I grown up and I grew up. And the title of our lesson today is based off that common phrase, keep it moving. They say when you go through a hard time, you gotta keep it moving. They say when you have a bad day, you gotta keep it moving. They say when you fell, you gotta keep it moving. They say when you have heart problems, you gotta keep it moving. Of course, deal with your heart, then keep it moving. You know, as a child, I participated in many sports. And the hardest ones I participated in, one of them was football. You know, I think my coach had it out for me because at the size of I am, he put me on the line, the offensive line. And if anybody knows the size of me, I'm only 5'6", a buck 60. But he said, go on the offensive line and play and guard our quarterback. Let's just say the quarterback had a rough season that year, amen? <laughs> I remember my mom tried to get me to swim, it was challenging. And I used to try to swim, and still, even today, I still don't know how to swim, guys. I just couldn't learn. It was very hard. But one of my hardest sports that I was learning was how to ride a bike. I would try, then I would fail. I would try, and then I will get in pain. And my dad was the one who taught me. And my dad was pretty a uh, hardcore teacher. He was like, man, get up, get up. But my dad was Nigerian. So he was saying in the African you know, uh, um, accent, get up, what are you doing? Get up, my son. <laughs> but everything my dad said, I remembered him saying to me, put your feet to the pedal and keep it moving. You know, the moment you stop, you lose your balance and you may fall. Yeah. It's the same in life. Albert Einstein stated, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Yeah. Title of the lesson, again, is keep it moving. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, for in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In Luke chapter 13, verse 33, Jesus, in any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. And in John chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your mat and walk. The only time that Jesus Christ stopped was to pray. What about you? When those emotions get into your hearts, do you stop moving? When you're going through things in the past, do you stop moving? When things are difficult in your life, do you stop moving? You know, spiritually in Galatians chapter five, it says keep in step with the spirit. But I think sometimes we could be like Michael Jackson and moonwalk <laughs> to the spirits instead of keeping in step to the spirits. We were never intended to stay still, always to keep it moving. It was said, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, just keep inching along. But always keep it moving. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, we find a very significant passage here with Tara. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, Let's read. Bible says, Terah took up his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that Haran, Ter Terah, the father of Abram, was supposed to go to Canaan, and that was on his heart. But the Bible makes it very clear that he entered Haran, and then it says he settled there. 
You know, there are many years that were wasted because he did not go where God told him to go. He stopped moving. You know, I'm pretty sure that this question will pop up, what if he went to the land of Canaan? You know, this didn't seem to affect Abraham as he goes on in Genesis 12 and he leaves at God's command and words to go to the land of Canaan. But I believe in some ways, it most likely probably affected Lot seeing their family stop in Haran and seeing Terah, his father, die there. Why wouldn't my God, my, my, my father, go all the way to the land of Canaan. In Genesis chapter 13, we see that Lot moved to Sodom and he settled there. And Sodom was his residence, that was his home. In Genesis chapter 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham with two of his angels. And let's just say God was fed up with everything that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. The sins have reached the limit. And he wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham begged God. He said, God, if there's 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, please do not take it out. And God said, if I find 50 righteous people there, I will not take it out. You know, Abraham kept praying, and it dwindled all the way down to about 10. He says, God, if there's 10 righteous people, please do not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But there wasn't even 10. Wow. There was only a lot. Yeah. You know, God sent his two angels to save Lot and his family and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to learn from this story today in Genesis chapter 19. Please turn there. Okay. You know, this passage I'm going to share with you is, is quite graphic. And I believe if the Bible was a movie, it will not be PG-13. Yes. It'll be rated R. And right now, you're about to get the rated R version. Amen? Amen. Put your seatbelts on. Let's hear the word of God. Come on, bro. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, the Bible says, The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. So the Bible starts off in, Luke, in uh, Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Lot was settled in Sodom, and he sat at the gate. So usually in, 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 in translation, it means he was in the town hall. And it was important men of the city that would sit in front of the city. So this signifies that Lot had a leadership role amongst Sodom where he lived. Let's keep reading in verse 2. The Bible says, my lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night, then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and enter this house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. So imagine your Lot. And you invite these angels. Hey, come over. Have a meal. Come spend time with me. Let me show you hospitality. They come. You're laughing with the angels. You're talking about life. You're talking about God. Then all of a sudden, it gets dark at night. And mind you, back in these times, there was no street lights, guys. Like when it was dark, it was dark. In pitch black darkness, the Bible says men from all, from Sodom and Gomorrah, comes to their door and it surrounds their house. You know, wickedness is like gangrene, it spreads. And right here, they wanted to rape these men. Can you imagine? the severity of wickedness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's keep reading in verse 6. The Bible says, Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection 
of my roof. You know, it's quite interesting that Lot will say, no, my friends. So this signifies that he identified with these men. These men are my friends. And then he offers his two daughters to these men. You know, during these times, when you, a guest is more protected than family, if you had a guest. But that still does not justify Lot's statement right here. Let's keep reading as things go on in verse 9. The Bible says, get out of the way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. So here, it shows that these men had no respect for Lot, even though he settled there. And they kept moving forward, but they kept moving forward in sin. Yeah. You know, the wickedness was so great in Sodom and Gomorrah. They had no regard for the Lord whatsoever. It kind of reminds me of nowadays. In Luke chapter 17, verse 28, we don't have to turn there, but Jesus says, in the, last, in the days of Lot, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. It was normal, that lifestyle to the people there. That's why they were eating, drinking, and just enjoying their time. It was a normal way of life. You know, many practice homosexuality today, and they ask, does the Bible condemn it? Yes, it does. And the world sees it as good. It's your life. Follow your hearts. Whatever your desires uh, want you to do, just do that. Don't let people tell you you're wrong. Homosexuality is a sin to God. But what about bitterness, greed, and hatred? Do you see the world as a corrupt place? I think sometimes we'd be so naive to what's going on in this world. That we feel like, what's wrong with everybody? Everything's fine. I'm enjoying my life. But yet God sees the world as a corrupt. That's why he sends disciples into the world to save the world. Like God's with me. Amen. Did you know that every single year there are 20 million new STD cases in America alone? Or did you know that 89% of all pornography is produced in the U.S.? Or that America has the highest rate of illegal drug use on the planet. Let's not even get into the abortions, or the murders, or the suicides. The list goes on. You know, it was a joke. If you had one guy with a gun, and one guy with a knife, and one guy with a Bible, many are likely to run from the man with the Bible. Wow. People do not want to be confronted with the truth. Wow. How are we this morning? Does the truth fear you? Is the Bible like kryptonite to you? Where you're like, no, stay away from me, the Bible. Yeah. Or you're like, man, I want to hear the Bible so I can change. Many do not want to be confronted with the truth. Are you for this garbage in the world or against it? I believe if you're not preaching against it, you are for it. There is no in between. We have to call people in this world to become like Jesus Christ. That's the only way to save the world. Amen. Verse 12. Let's continue reading. The Bible says in verse 12, the two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? Sons in law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. Their outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, and you will be, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the man grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters 
and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Point number one, move past your comfort. Move past your comfort. You know, Lot knew how wicked Sodom was, yet the Bible makes it very clear that he hesitated to leave. The angels were more urgent than Lot to get out of that city. And Lot was like, ah, oh, God. He couldn't choose between the two. The biggest problem was not that Lot was living in Sodom, but that Sodom was living in Lot. It seeped its way right into his heart. And I think for us, we don't understand how much of the world seeps into our heart. How much of Miami culture and Miami sin can just seep into our hearts and can make us so dull as disciples. I remember back in the past, I lived in Philadelphia. And uh, my cousin was moving here from Nigeria. Super huge for my cousin moved here from Nigeria. He was excited. He was like, man, I can't wait to see your country. I mean, I'm so fired up to see your country. He didn't say fired up, but he was excited. <laughs> so when he came, guys, he was so critical of the United States. Everything that he seen in Philadelphia was so critical. I was like, oh, why are these guys smoking around there? Why are they smoking? They're sweating and it's hot and they're smoking. They look stupid. Why, why, why do that? Oh, why people are walking? Why people are doing all these different things? He was so furious and so critical of everything that was going on. And he thought that smoking cigarettes was the dumbest thing that he'd ever seen. Guess what happened a couple years later? He started smoking cigarettes himself. I'm like, Shemezi, what, what, <laughs> what happened, man? You're preaching so, uh, so fire against it. He conformed to the world. Yo, either you conform the world or the world conforms you. What happened to him? is that he allowed the world to seep into his heart. And he became just like everybody else. Maybe Lot showed up to Sodom, he was super fired up. He's like, man, I'm gonna change this city for God. And he's fired up to make a difference. But he had grown comfortable in Sodom and his values had wormed their way into his heart. You know, I believe the world is like quicksand. It slows you down, you struggle, and it stops you from making progress with God. The more you fight to get out of the word, the harder it gets. You don't gradually get out of quicksand. You radically get out of quicksand. And that's the only way that you can be saved. You know, many of us have started with so much fire in the beginning of the year. But our sin, our defeat, our hearts, dwindled our fire to a spark. How can you tell? Just like Lot, there was hesitation. There's hesitation to repent of sin. There's hesitation to serve. There's hesitation to preach the word of God. Guys, we see this world as a world that needs help. Or we see this world that everything's okay. You know, for me, um, it's been a crazy, exciting, crazy year. And I believe in the beginning of the year, we had so many great visions and so many great plans. And I had great plans and great visions in the beginning of the year as well, too. Super fun, I was like, let's do it for Jesus, yes! Any sin I was struggling with, repent. Any failures I had, repent and let's go. But sadly, when the sins catch up with you and the comfort catches up with you, it starts to get you to stop walking with Jesus Christ. You know, this year, I believe the hardest sacrifice I had to make was living right here in Aventura and driving every single day to Boca to drop my son off to his therapy and coming back also as well too. Yeah. Guys, I will make a four hour trip every single day to drive my son all the way up there and drive him all the way back and then continue my ministry down here in Aventura. Over time, in the beginning, I was like, man, I can do this. This is going to be great. God is with me. I used to pray along the way. It used to be exciting. It used to be awesome. Yeah. But over time, I just, my heart started getting weighed down even more. And instead of going to God for comfort, I went to my sin for comfort. Um, I went to the sin of overeating, oversleeping. 
Um, my quiet times were not fired up. Um, I just was not zealous as I was before. I remember last week, um, I got to sit down with our awesome shepherds, Ted and Kathy. And guys, we haven't sat down with them in a long time. Um, and, but in this time, it was, it, was, it was definitely incredible when we sat down with them. Kathy just asked me, hey, how's it going? <laughs> very nice way, very nice. She's like, how's it going? I was like, oh. <laughs> and in a way, I kind of put my head down. I was like, man, this, this, that, this, this, that. And I realized I wasn't getting my comfort in God alone. You know, I want to thank you for, uh, say thank you for Ted and Kathy and also my wife for calling me out and helping me out in my faith. They were like the two angels that grabbed Lot because I, it, I was like Lot and I'm like, oh, I like staying where I am. But they're like, hey, come on and let's go. Let's keep it moving. You know, um, I really love the Supermans and Superman 3 is my favorite one in the 80s. I love old movies. Um, in this movie, Sir, Superman was um, fighting against General Zod and his partners. And through his discouragement and fatigue and failure, he eventually gave up being Superman. He was like, hey, this is not for me. I'm done with it. And he was okay with being just Clark Kent. He desired comfort more than saving the world. Yeah. And sometimes as disciples, we can throw out the spirit of God. We can throw away the, the sword. And instead of being superheroes in this dark world, we can say, I just want to be me. You know, as he saw the world being more corrupt, he couldn't remain the same. He couldn't just say, oh, I'm just gonna leave the world how it is. The more vigorous he got, the more fired up he got to make a difference. And he took it upon himself. You know, we must realize that our lives are not meant to live in comfort, but to save lives. God has a plan for us. You know, the scripture that helped me is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I was trying to find comfort in the world and I had no business trying to find comfort in the world, not Jesus. But I realized that my comfort must come from Jesus. I fasted, I prayed, I was fighting to get out of quicksand. And here I am today. It was a whatever it takes attitude to make it happen. Where are you at today? You know, for those who are studying the Bible, are you hesitating to get right with God? If you are hesitating to get right with God, you approve of this world and living in this world. What about, what are you guys about disciples? Where are you at today? Are you stuck in your sin? Or are you moving fast for God? Are you fired up? Do you need to be refreshed? My challenge to you is to get your refreshment from the word of God and prayer and other disciples. Get the help that you need and call for help. Amen? Amen. You know, true life begins at the end of your comfort. Amen? Amen? Let's read verse 17. The Bible says in verse 17, it says, as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in a plane. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here's a town near enough to run to and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zoar. Point number two, move past your fears. Yeah. Lot had a choice to make, and life is all about choices. Either I go to the mountains, or I go to the small place, which is named Zoar. Yeah. 
You, you all heard the phrase, go big or go home. Yeah. But when you're fearful, it paralyzes you. Yeah. When you're fearful to, call, to, to follow the call of God, it traps you. It stops you from going anywhere. Fear is nothing but love upside down. We can fear the unknown, and many of us can be standstill. You know, growing up in Philadelphia, I've seen many athletes that were great in the city. One of my friends was an extremely great basketball player, extremely great. I mean, he had the skills that, man, he could have went to college, D Division I level, and also go to the NBA. But we used to look at Johnny and say, Johnny, how come you're in the same state as you were the last year? What I realized was the fear kept him there. Many said, man, he had so much potential. He could have been great. And many times as a disciple, we can say to one another, man, you have so much potential. What is stopping you from being great? What is holding you back today from going above and beyond for God? Where you don't choose to go to the mountains, you choose to go to a small place named Zoar. It's self-doubt holding you back. It's self-pity holding you back. You ever wrote your dreams down and you didn't believe it? You kind of chuckled at it yourself? You're like, yeah, right. <laughs> You're the one writing them down, and you're like, man, this is never going to happen. You know, sadly, if we don't believe the dreams are not going to happen, they probably won't happen. Yeah. Because God expects us to have faith. There's no dream that's too big when it comes to God. Many of us say, if I fail, it will be worse, so I will stay the same. Do not be afraid to pierce 365 times in the Bible, guys. 365 times. How many days are in the year, guys? 365. There's a scripture on not being afraid for every day of the year. I think God is trying to teach us something right here, guys. He's saying God wants us to walk faithfully for 365 days a year with no fear. I can't imagine my son being so afraid when I have him in my hands and saying, Daddy, I'm still afraid. As a father, I will feel hurt. Son, I have you in my hands. Why are you still afraid? Yeah. How do you feel like God feels when we say, God, I'm struggling with anxiety? Anxiety is all about control. You're not willing to allow God to work in your life. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, it says, do not fear tomorrow. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus tells the disciples, do not be afraid. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock. In Matthew 10, verse 28, the only one we should fear is God. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, the cast is to throw your anxiety onto God and say, God, you deal with it. Yeah. That's what it means to cast your anxiety on him. God is saying, hey, throw your anxiety, throw me all your problems. I'm gonna take care of you. Just live for me and go above and beyond and do not let fear stop you from greatness. Wow. You know, at 80 years old, if you make it, would your statement be, I wish I would've? I don't want to live with no regrets in my life. Each day is very precious. Every time we have, it's precious, even with each other. You know, we got to dream big for God. Now, I want to challenge the disciples to write down your dreams and belief and keep it moving towards greatness. You know, Lot, he had a plan for him, and God had a great plan for him. But he said, no, I'm going to Zoar. And he was convinced that he had to be there. Many of us are so convinced on where we have to be in life without any advice and no direction from God. Even against the advice, we're like, man, I'm going this way regardless because I believe that God has called me to go this way. But if Lot would have been humble to the angel's directions, if he would have been humble to God, where would his life 
have been. I want to encourage you guys to move past your fears and move on to greatness. Point number three, lead as you move. Look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, it says, By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. From the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew these cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. You know, Lot got what he wanted, correct? Yeah. He moved and he made it to Zoar. Yes, I made it, great! But his wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. In Luke chapter 17, verse 31 to 32, Jesus used an example of Lot's wife as he speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. Most likely, Lot's wife looked back, but not only looked back, but had a purposeful return back to the doomed city. As she glanced and was about to go back, she became a pillar of salt. Can you imagine? She was so tied to the city that even as it was burning, she wanted to go back and burn with it. That's how much she was tied to the city of Sodom. You know, when I think about this, I think of husbands leading their wives. You know, as of now, I've been married for 10 years, guys. Well, almost 10 years. In October 20th, we'll be celebrating our 10-year anniversary. And my wife has put up with me for 10 years, guys. She put up with all my problems. And I say, oh, my problems. And she will love me through every single problem I had. Amen. She's shown me the true love of Jesus Christ. Amen, but I realize every single day before I go to sleep is that I lead this woman. I lead my son. My actions determine where she's going to end up. Yeah. I say, man, I don't want that pressure, God. But God says that pressure is on you. Follow me, and follow me wholeheartedly, and you will be okay. You know, husbands, we cannot stop. Don't stop. This is for our wives as well. Single brothers, don't stop. This is for our brothers and our sisters. Single sisters, don't stop. This is for our sisters. You know, it's time for us to make a radical difference here in this world. You know, if you're visiting here with us today, I'm a man that follows God that's looking for other men that want to follow God and be preachers. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for preachers, amen, that's going to preach against this dark world so that others can follow Jesus Christ. I want to tell you guys to join us as we take over Miami Fort Lauderdale with the gospel. You know, on um, Friday night, we had our D group, and we had the Francois and the Gaspers over. It was a very special time. Um, and um, the Francois and the Gaspers, we're all very close friends. But for us to be in the same room and talk about what we can do to make God's kingdom great, it meant so much. What we talked about was the Marys are to protect the church. Yeah. We are called to be hospitable to the singles and the campus students. We are called to be the example. I don't want people coming and see my marriage like, I don't want to get married, no way. I don't ever want to get married. That is scary, guys. You don't want that. I want singles in campus to see my marriage and say, man, I want that. That's what I want for myself in my life. So we talked about being shepherds, about meeting the needs of the region. And my brothers and sisters, it was an incredible time of bonding. And we're going to make every effort to make sure that the campus and the singles are well taken care of Come in the on. Northeast and beyond. Amen? Amen. Yesterday, we had our 12th meeting. And it was a meeting with the leaders in the Northeast. And we went over a lesson I call the family that leads the family. We have to understand that family is everything, guys. You know, we can call this a group, we can call it an organization, but it doesn't mean a thing 
until you label it as family. Because when it's labeled as family, there's expectation. There's expectation for you to be a bro or a father, amen? Or a mother. And many people don't want that expectation. We talked about how we can make the Northeast great. We talked about how we can serve the other regions. We talked about how to take ownership. And we talked about how to protect. I truly believe those radical group of disciples are going to do amazing things. And we're going to gain even more radical, faithful disciples to conquer this world in our time. Amen? Amen. You know, for us, where are you at today? Are you ready to make a move for God? Maybe you're studying the Bible and you're deciding, man, should I follow God with all my heart? My question to you is why wouldn't you follow God with all your heart? Why wouldn't you follow God in this dark world? People are dying every single day. And you have a choice to be with a God for eternal life. You know, for us today as disciples, we have a choice to make. Either we're going to stop and allow our sin to stop us from doing great things for God, or we're going to deal with our heart, repent, and move forward and do great things for him. The decision and a choice is yours. And I want to end off by this song, which is very touching to my heart. And the song is entitled, Keep It Moving. The song says, I ain't stopping nothing. When the going gets tough, not going to give up. I'm, I'm on to something. When the going gets tough, not going to give up. Got to keep up, keep it moving. Got to keep up, keep it moving. Got to keep up, keep it moving. Mm. I want to encourage us to never stop and to go far and wide for our relationship with God. And we can always keep it moving. Love you guys. Thank you. Come on.